Thank you for joining us today. We're excited that you came across this message. The sermon you're about to watch is from our Easter weekend 2023. If you are joining us for the first time, I want to be the first to say, welcome to Hope Church. If you are joining us for the first time, I want to be the first to say, welcome to Hope Church. Go ahead and open up the Hope Church LV app or visit hopechurchlv.com and click connect with us to fill out a short digital connection card. Once again, thanks for joining us today. As we are preparing for Pastor Scott to come and to share the message this morning, we're going to read from the Gospel of John, the 11th chapter. We're going to read verses 1 through 26. If you have a Bible with you, we invite you to take out your Bible and to turn to the Gospel of John, the 11th chapter. We're going to begin reading in verse 1. If you do not have a Bible, the words will be on the screen so you can follow along. And it says, beginning in verse 1, Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, get this, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you and you are going there again. Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Now, when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. But Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for the resurrection and the life that you are and that your word brings. And we celebrate that life today. 
Thank you for Pastor Scott. I lift him up to you as he comes. I pray that the words of his mouth and the meditations of his heart would all be acceptable in your sight and that your word would transform lives. We thank you. We give you glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, happy Easter, Hope Church family. So glad you have joined us here today. Amen. We can get excited for the resurrection of Jesus. Pastor Teddy just said, my name is Scott. I have the privilege of being the senior pastor here at Hope Church. I know many people join us as guests on Easter, and we are so, so grateful that you have joined us to celebrate Jesus Christ, this man who all over the world today, millions, billions of people will celebrate this one name, Jesus Christ, who both secular and Christian historians agree, really lived on this earth. There is no credible historian that does not admit Jesus Christ actually lived. In fact, he not only lived, but he, he caused quite a stir in the ancient Near East where he gained quite the following to the point where every legitimate historian agrees he was killed for it nailed to a Roman cross, an execution tool. Everybody, every historian worth their salt agrees Jesus Christ lived and Jesus Christ died. Some friends brought some some atheist friends of theirs to our Thursday night service. Nobody disagrees with that because the history books are very clear, Christian and secular. He lived, he died. But this, what happens next, is where the history books differ. You see, for Christians, we believe and celebrate that three days later, he did not stay dead, but he rose again from the grave. In fact, showing that he was not just a man. This was God in the flesh who came to save his people from their sins. And his death over death, his victory over death, claimed victory for all humanity. This is the story of Easter. And this is why this room is packed to celebrate this reality. But secular historians have done everything they can for 2,000 years to explain all that away. Maybe you're even here today and prescribed to something else must have happened. He surely didn't rise from the dead. And so we have theories and intellectual conversations because if he actually rose from the dead, you have to deal with that. People don't just get up out of death and walk out alive. The resurrection, if it really happened, it begs an explanation. This happened 2,000 years ago, and yet here we are, a packed room in Las Vegas, one little sliver of what will happen hundreds of thousands of times all throughout this day and have been happening this weekend all over the globe. I'll say it to you this way throughout the message. Resurrection begs a response. If this really happened, we must respond in some way. So as Pastor Teddy already read for us, John chapter 11, we are going to look at a story of resurrection. And throughout this story, we're all going to have multiple opportunities to respond to the word of God. So how we do it here at Hope, if you're new, is we just like make our way through this story, kind of a running commentary as we study and celebrate Easter. So if you're ready for some Bible, say, let's go. Let's go. So jumping right into this story, first, let's talk about our characters. If you're new to Bible study, we meet three people in this story, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. This is a brother and two sisters who are not, who are not foreign to Jesus' life. We see them pop up in Jesus' life all the time. These are, these are good friends of Jesus. And so we enter into our story where his really good friend Lazarus is sick. And he's not just sick with the sniffles. He's like sick, sick. Like really on his deathbed fighting for his life kind of sick. And so what do they do? They do what they know how to do, which is call out to the one who can fix it. 
Mary and Martha say, go get Jesus. He's the one we've seen do miracles. He can fix this. Go get the one who could do something about this. This is the 1990s Chicago Bulls in the NBA Finals with three seconds left and down by two. There's one person to give the ball to, Hope Church. Michael Jordan. (laughs) Go get the goat. He can fix this. That's what's happening in our story. We've seen him do it time and time again. Go get Jesus. But as we'll see in our story, Jesus doesn't do exactly what he thought, what they thought he would do. He doesn't do what they thought he would do. In fact, you just need to know, we've been praying that for some of you, Jesus would do some things you did not think he would do in this place today. He's going to actually tell them right up front what he plans to do. Let's read it in verse 4. John 11 verse 4 says, but when Jesus heard it, heard what? That his friend Lazarus was sick. He said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the son of God may be glorified through it. I've highlighted some some spots in our text today because it's okay to feel the tension. In fact, I want us to feel the tension. There are times when you read the Bible and you think, That doesn't seem right. A sickness that brings glory to God? What's going on here, Jesus? This is your friend. What is Jesus doing here? I want us to feel the tension and we'll continue to see it throughout our story. What is Jesus doing here? We mentioned it earlier, but for those new to the story of Scripture, this is no ordinary man. Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. And so what that means is when Martha and Mary sent word to Jesus as God in the flesh, this did not surprise him. He wasn't wondering what he was going to do with his friend Lazarus being sick. No, this was not unexpected. Jesus knew exactly what he was going to do. He was going to show them and us, this is who I am and this is what I do. He's about to turn a tragic story into a resurrection story. So this Easter, that's what we're going to do. We're going to study this story. We're going to see how Jesus relates to this situation and and relates to this family. And in fact, we're going to see how he still relates to us. So we'll do that by looking at three realities from this resurrection story. Very simply, three realities from this resurrection story. Here's the first one. Jesus is still sovereign and in control. That is true right now as we sit in this room. Jesus is still sovereign and in control. Let's pick it up in verses 5 and 6. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. I've highlighted it for you so you can feel the awkward. <laughs> Jesus loves this family. These are his friends, maybe some of his best friends. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he rushed to his bedside to heal him on the spot because he would never want his friend to suffer. It's not what it says. Feel this. Jesus heard that Lazarus was fighting for his life. So he stayed. He waited. Can we, can we keep it real? He let his friend die. Some of you may be thinking, well, what's up with that? That doesn't make any sense. Feel it? There's a side conversation with his disciples, and then we'll pick up in verse 14 and 15. And Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. Watch him turn up the tension even more. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Come on, Jesus, what are you doing here? I I was glad for your sake that I was not there. I was glad that I wasn't there when my friend died What are you doing here? And I know what some of you are thinking. Man, 
I came to the 945 service at Easter at Hope to, to be encouraged. Where's the story of hope and, and resurrection? What is Jesus doing here and why are we talking about it? This doesn't make any sense. Yes, that's true. Unless the one in control is sovereign and doing something special. That's exactly what he's doing. That's what he says there at the end of verse 15. So that you may believe. Here's what I want us to see. He was doing something in their grieving that would lead to their believing. And that's where some of you might be this morning. I'd be willing to bet there's some people that even as we've started to unpack this story, you, you feel yourself in this story. You're thinking, I, I feel like Martha and Mary. I'm like hanging on by a thread. I've called out to Jesus. I've heard he's powerful. I've heard he can do big things. And I've like called out and, and I've heard nothing. In fact, let's be honest, you're, you're here on Easter services thinking, I'm just giving it one more shot. Maybe if I come to church, I can get closer to God and he'll actually respond to me. Some of you feel like Martha and Mary, you've called out. Step in whenever you want to, God. And you've heard nothing. It seems like God might not care about your situation. Maybe he's waiting on purpose. And you're like, what's up with that? Why would God seemingly wait to intervene in Lazarus's life and maybe in yours? And here's where I want to just settle down for just a moment. I believe he may be doing that because he is sovereign. Sovereign. There, there's a good church word. What on earth does sovereign mean? Let's put it on the screen. Sovereign, one that exercises supreme authority. Another way I like to talk about God's sovereignty is he is the boss. He's in charge. He's the boss. There's never a moment where God is out of control. We, we do not believe in a God who is constantly changing his plans based on what's going on in the world. Oh, didn't see that coming. Let me pivot. Oh, didn't see that coming. Let me change my plans. Some people view God like a, like a cosmic traffic, air traffic controller, constantly pivoting and changing based on what happens on the earth. That is not the God of the Bible. We read of a God who is sovereign and I believe that sovereignty can be an anchor for us because listen it's not just that he's sovereign he's also good and when a sovereign God is a good God that's a God that we can trust no matter what we see and that's the God of this story and of your story I thought about it this week in relation to me as a parent many of you in here are parents my wife and I Candace have four kids and in junior high and elementary school, so right now our season of life is a little chaotic. And you parents know this, you're the boss. <laughs> you are sovereign over your home. And let's be honest, sometimes our kids don't understand that or like that very much. And I'll never forget a few years ago when one of my kids, and I'll, I'll try to, won't say who it is just in case this gets back to them, but one of my kids, I was disciplining them and I was trying to show them that I love them and that's why I'm disciplining them. Parents, you've had this hard discussion. I love you, so I'm disciplining you and I'll never forget, she looked at me and she, uh, I just gave it away, dang it. Uh, <laughs> I have two daughters, so we don't know which one it is. <laughs> she looked at me and she said, this doesn't look like love. I told her, I know, but here's the deal. I'm, I'm your dad, and I see things you don't see. My, my wife and I are not making decisions. We as parents don't make decisions on what feels good for our kids in the moment, but what is good for their lifetime. This is what we see here. Amen. So that's, that's a little picture of sovereignty in our home. I, I know this doesn't feel like love, babe, but this is actually good for you. You may be here today and you're looking up at heaven saying, this doesn't feel like you're good. It doesn't feel like you're sovereign. And this sure doesn't feel like love. Remember, God sees what you don't see. God sometimes allows things and brings things into your life, not because of the moment, but for your lifetime. Something may be happening in your life and that's where you need to rest today. God is Still sovereign. Jesus is still sovereign and in control. 
and he's still good. But number two, Jesus is still present and near. Jesus is still present and near. Remember, they had been crying out to Jesus to fix this. And he knew he was setting them up for a resurrection story. I believe some of you are here today and you're feeling Martha and Mary thinking, where is God? And I just want to encourage you, he may be setting your story up for a resurrection because he is still present and near. After some discussion, his disciples and they head to the town where Lazarus has now died. And as they're walking into town, Martha comes running out to meet him. We'll pick it up in verse 21, Martha said to Jesus, feel her words right here. Lord, if you had been here, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Later on in verse 32, her sister Mary basically says the same thing. Lord, if you would have just been here, what are they saying? They're saying the same thing. Your physical absence equals passivity. You weren't here, so you weren't doing anything. If you just would have been here, Jesus, you could have done something. But now, you're too late. You're too late. You can't do anything. And let's not be too hard on Martha and Mary. If you're like me, you've, you've been there. You see a situation and you think, well, God missed his opportunity. Interesting enough, though, Jesus doesn't really respond to this. He doesn't defend himself. He just says what he says in verse 23 and 24. Jesus said to her, he tells her straight up, this is what I'm going to do. Your brother will rise again. Look at what Martha says in verse 24. I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Did you hear it? Jesus tells her straight up, he will rise again. And Martha goes, I know, Jesus, I know. What she's talking about, if you're new to Bible study, is is the resurrection on the last day. What's going to happen when all believers spend forever with Jesus in heaven. So Jesus is trying to encourage her. And Martha's just saying, okay, Jesus, like, don't give me your spiritual sound bites in a moment like this. I know that one day out in the ether, I'll see my brother again. But, like, how does that help me right now? You ever feel like that? I love how real verse 24 is. I've lived in verse 24. Here's this sister, Martha, reeling the death of her brother. Honestly, probably feeling some type of way against her friend Jesus who could have done something, but he didn't. In fact, he waited. And she's just staring at him like, why would you do this? And then Jesus says, he'll rise again. And you can just imagine Martha rolling her eyes like, are you serious right now? You're going to go there right now? How about I'm sorry? How about let's fix this? You're going you're to go there right now? This is real for all of us because some of us have been so close to spiritual truth that it actually begins to lose its sting in our lives. In fact, some of you are here and we praise God, but you're kind of more of a Christmas and Easter kind of church attender. And guess what? You're not off the hook either. We live in a culture where you can know just enough spiritual truth to be a danger to yourself. We could slip into Martha mode. I know what the Bible says. I know what I've heard in church. But what does it have to do with me now? Like, how does that fix my marriage? How does that fix my mental health issues that I'm walking through right now? And listen, it's not just church attenders, it's pastors too. How many times have I slipped into Martha mode when somebody tries to encourage me or I read the word and and I go, okay, okay, I know, Lord. I'm not supposed to lean on my own understanding, but trust you in all my ways, acknowledge you, and, and you'll direct my paths, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. I know, I know. I know, Lord, that you work all things together for good for those that love you and are called according to your purposes, Romans 8, 28. I know, I know, I know. Okay, I know, I know that I can do all things, Jesus, through you who gives me strength, Philippians 4, 13. I know, but what does that do for my current mess? Some of you feel that right now. Believers, 
unbelievers, whoever you are, you feel this. And yet Jesus is sitting there in this moment. He's not distant and passive. He's not giving spiritual platitudes. He's present. He's near. And he's about to change everything. See, because Jesus is still sovereign and in control. Jesus is still present and near. But third and finally, Jesus is still the resurrection and the life. That's what he says in verse 25. And Jesus said to her, this is his response to her. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Notice he doesn't say, hey, Martha, I I bring resurrection. No, he said, I am the resurrection. This is a statement of authority. In fact, if he's just a man, this guy's out of bounds. He better be somebody with that kind of claim. Preacher in the 1800s named J.C. Ryle, he he put it pretty well. He said, this is basically Jesus saying, "I, I am the great spring and source of all life. Whatever life anyone has, eternal, spiritual, physical, is all owing to me. All that are raised from the grave will be raised by me. All that are spiritually quickened are quickened by me. Separate from me, there is no life at all. He's looking at Martha and saying, Martha, what you need right now, I am. What your brother Lazarus needs as he's sitting in that grave, I am. What you need, Hope Church Easter attender at the 945 or at the 945 service, Jesus says to you, I am. See, some of you know those two little words are massively significant in the story of scripture. In fact, in different parts of the Old Testament, this is actually how God introduces himself as the I am. What does that mean? It's it's God saying, I am eternal. It's the divine name of God. I am sovereign. I am the king of glory. Nothing is before me. Nothing is bigger than me. Reality doesn't define me. I define reality. I am It's a massively significant phrase in the Bible. And get this, this Jesus, while he walked on this earth, he actually had the audacity to claim that he was and is the great I am. This is massive. He's saying, I am the resurrection and the life. This I am is in the flesh in front of Mary, the God of all power and authority. He's telling Mary, listen, when I got here, The resurrection got here. Listen, Martha, the resurrection is not just an event. The resurrection is a person, and it's the person I am. Some of you need to hear that today. I believe there's someone here, multiple people here that have been crying out to God saying, why don't you do something, God, in my life? I'm crying out. Why don't you do something? Hear the words of Jesus over your life to that question. He might be saying to you, I am. Maybe you're here today and you're thinking, I I need hope. Hear the words of Jesus. I am. What on earth is going on here, you say? Jesus says, I am. Is anybody going to fix this? It's a mess. Somebody going to fix this? Jesus might be saying to you, I am. Is anything real anymore? I am. Why is no one listening to me? Jesus says to you today, I am. I just need someone in this with me, grieving, suffering, going through this situation. I just need someone with me. Hear the words of Jesus over your life today. I am. This great I am is still the resurrection and the life, the sovereign one who has never been out of control, who has never been passive. And in this situation, he was setting them up for an epic miracle. I encourage you to read the story later on. He does, in fact, raise Lazarus from the dead physically. It's this amazing scene. He says, roll back the stone. Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus stops being dead. A miracle. 
And here's what I want us to see. They were praying for a sickness to be healed and God had in store for them a resurrection. Some of you today are praying way too small of prayers because God's got something way bigger in store for you if you could just trust him. Put it to you this way. God allowed a death so that there could be a resurrection. So that gets us back to where we started. Resurrection begs a response. Not just of us, of Martha. Look at it in verse 26. He simply asks Martha, do you believe this? Not do you agree with this, Martha? Can you intellectually wrap your head around this, Martha? Do you believe this? It's a word that talks about the faith in the deep-seated part of who we are, a, a belief that is a conviction that leads to life change. This is in the depth of who you are. Do you believe this? Some of you have picked up what we're putting down today. You see, this is not just a 2,000-year-old story about a family and a guy named Lazarus. This is the grand story of Easter. See, we live in a world that God created and he created it to be perfect. It was perfect. It was exactly how God designed it to be, but then sin entered in, rebellion against that God and it broke what God had made good. In our society, it's becoming increasingly easier as a pastor to explain sin to people. We just see it everywhere. We see it on our phones. We see it in our feeds. We see it in front of our faces. But I need you to hear, it's not just sin out there. It's sin in here. See, the Bible would say we weren't just born into this world bad. We weren't just born into this world broken. The Bible actually says we were born into this world spiritually dead. Look at it in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. Very simply, and you, that's all of us, were dead in your trespasses and sins. Hear this. Spiritually speaking, we were all as hopeless as Lazarus in that grave completely helpless to do anything to raise our life back up. Dead people don't do anything. Think about how much power Lazarus had in that grave. Zero. He was dead. Apart from a miracle on his behalf, he would be helpless and hopeless. But that is the miracle of Easter. You see, God so loved the world, the sovereign God of all glory, so loved the world that he sent Jesus, the resurrection and the life, to come into this world to live a perfect life that we could not live. We could never live perfect. Jesus did. But not only did he live, as we talked about earlier, he died. He died the death you and I should have died sacrificed himself on that Roman cross as an execution sacrificially for our sin. And the Bible says all of your and my sin were placed on Jesus and he paid our penalty. But the good news of Easter is that when they put him in that grave on Friday, he busted out of that thing on Sunday. And today he is not dead. He is alive and he is well and he stands ready to now save you and I from our sins. God allowed a death so that there could be a resurrection. And in the case of Jesus, I'll level it up. God purposed a death so that there could be a resurrection. It was the redemption story of eternity that God would die for the sins of his people to bring them back into right relationship with himself. He is the resurrection and the life. If you're here today and you don't know, we as Christians do not follow some dead religion. We worship a risen savior. He is alive. And resurrection begs a response. 
Today, I wanna ask every person in the room what Jesus asked Martha that day. Do you believe this? Not I can check some boxes intellectually. Not I can wrap my head around the concept. Do you believe this? That deep-seated conviction that leads to life change. I believe there are a bunch of people in the room that do believe this and have been following that life that Jesus offers for years and years and years. Praise God for salvation and those of you that are followers of Jesus. But I also believe there are some people in the room that right now, spiritually speaking, are just like Lazarus. And today, I hope you've heard the good news that like Lazarus, you can come out of that grave. Right now, you are dead in your sin, but because of what Jesus has done for you, you can now walk in life, in a relationship, a friendship with this God. How? How do you do this? Romans chapter 10, verse 9 tells us. We've actually been praying this as a church all week long, that people that don't know would hear and respond this way. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And it says right there, as plain as day, you will be saved. Not you might be saved. Not if you do enough good things this week. He's already done everything necessary to bring you to spiritual life. You will be saved. The resurrection of Jesus makes it possible for every person to walk in true and satisfying, abundant life. And it's a gift you and I receive by grace through faith. Simply believing and confessing. I believe that. I want to receive the gift of salvation today. It happened for me almost 20 years ago. 20 years ago this summer, I went to a summer camp. I walked into that summer camp as a person dead in my trespasses and sins. And I heard a message very similar to this one. And I knew that I knew that I knew, just like people at our Thursday service, just like people at the eight o'clock service knew, that's for me. And I confessed with my mouth, believed in my heart and I was saved and it has not been perfect, but I'm telling you, I'm looking back now at 20 years of God's faithfulness and fulfilling every single promise he's ever made to me without fail. All the times I've failed him, he's never failed me once. Some of you need to say yes today to a relationship with Jesus. So I'm gonna ask every person in the room just to bow your heads for just a moment. Sometimes it's just easier to just think and Be still and be quiet in the moments by yourself with your head bowed. Maybe you're here today and you're a follower of Jesus. Praise God for the followers of Jesus that are here to worship our risen Savior. I hope today was just an exclamation point for your faith. That you do not worship a dead religion, but you worship a risen Savior. You are here today stepping into that resurrection life. Maybe you're here and you're a follower of Jesus that's kind of stepped away from that life. I hope today has been an encouragement. There's nothing greater than Jesus. You could search all the world and never find it. So remember who you are and remember the resurrection life you've been given. But maybe you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus. And you thought you came because somebody invited you with an invite card or one of your family members or friends drugged you here. But I would submit to you, I actually don't think that's why you're here. I think you're here because there's a sovereign God who so orchestrated it for you to be in this room to hear the message that could radically change your life. If you're here today and you just heard the message from the word of God and you're saying, I want to step into a relationship with Jesus, how do I do it? It's exactly what Romans 10 said. Confess. One of the ways we confess is just to pray. So if you're here today and you want to begin a relationship with Jesus, just like I did 20 years ago, I want you to just repeat a prayer after me in your heart. It's not the words of a prayer that save you. Jesus saves you. But prayer is a way we confess that he's Lord. Believe in our heart. So if you're here today and you want to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, I just invite you right there quietly before the Lord. Just repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I confess that I have sinned against you. I confess that you died on the cross for my sin. I confess that you rose again from the dead. Jesus, I turn from my sin. 
I receive your salvation. I thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, can we celebrate with every person in this room? Listen, only the Lord right now knows who just surrendered the control of their life to Jesus. But here's what I need you to hear me very clearly. You were never meant to live the Christian life alone. We are passionate here at Hope. We don't want any spiritual orphans in Las Vegas. If you are here and you just said yes to a relationship with Jesus, you've got to do something for me before you leave. At some point before you leave this campus, there's a little connection card in front of you. You can scan a digital copy. Fill that out. Give it to somebody. We're going to be down here in just a minute. We always stand and respond to the word of God through singing. We're going to be down here. Some of us are going to be down here. Maybe you want to come and just give us that card or or tell us that you began a relationship with Jesus because we want to walk with you. You were never meant to live the Christian life alone. I'll never forget there was one guy, a leader that I connected with on my way back from that summer camp. And that relationship changed my life because I learned how to follow Jesus from that guy. You need some people to help you learn to walk out this new relationship because you did not just make a decision. You began a relationship with Jesus. God's designed it where his family, the church, helps people do that. In fact, if you just gave your life to Jesus, we have a little gift we'd love to give you. This is just a box of resources that just helps you along the way as we begin to walk this out with you. So at some point, don't leave our campus without getting this. We'd love to put this in your hands and just say thank you, thank you, thank you for coming and thank you for joining in our family now as we help you follow Jesus. In just a moment, we're gonna have pastors down here. Maybe you gave your life to Christ, come tell somebody. But for everybody else, we're just gonna stand and worship. We're gonna stand and we're gonna sing to our risen King. All hail King Jesus. Maybe there's some things going on in your life that you'd love prayer for. We're gonna be down here just to pray and to minister and however it is the Lord is leading, we wanna say yes, Jesus. We wanna follow him in obedience. So Jesus, thank you for the empty grave. We stand today because of your victory and we say all hail King Jesus. Thank you for the people that you just saved, Lord. Pray they would not leave this place without letting us know so we can walk with them. Pray as you lead right now for believers who need to respond and just pray with people or maybe come down to this altar and just have some moments with the Lord. However you lead, Holy Spirit, we trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand and let's worship our risen King.